Korea. Uh, I've been doing business in Asia most of my adult life. I've lived in Hong Kong, Shanghai, Beijing, Seoul. Uh, my background came out of the virtual currency space and games. I've been in digital currency since 1999. Started a business in 2001 called IGE, which was the I was the primary market maker for all of the virtual worlds. Uh, so in I built up a supply chain of 400,000 people in China in the early 2000s that were playing games like World of Warcraft and Second Life to mine digital currency. And so I was the primary market maker in the world. I've done tens of billions of dollars of business in that space. My main investor in that business was Goldman Sachs Principal Strategies. GSPS no longer exists because of the financial crisis, but at the time, they were responsible for 40% of Goldman's earnings. They were the black box of Goldman Sachs, and I was the first private investment they ever made. And that's because I ran a more complicated prop desk than they did. I was managing more markets, more economies, more assets, etc. And that's what eventually led me to this. Um, but Korea was always like the mecca of that business. Um, I rolled up the Korean market. I was the only foreigner I've ever met that kind of crushed it over there. I had over 90% market share doing a billion dollars a year. I sold that business last fall, a year ago. Um, and so, because uh, I've been getting out of everything that's not crypto for some time. So Korea is huge. And so why Korea? Why China? The markets that, um, so it's the cryptographers and the great technologists that basically made all of this possible in solving the Byzantine generals problem and then continuing to innovate through kind of blockchain 1.0s to 2.0s. And, um, but it's the markets where you have online gamers. It's the places where people are buying and have been selling digital assets inside of these markets where you're seeing that they call it the earliest mass adoption. It's, that's where the market of people were the most familiar and the most willing to kind of step into this. You know, Korea having been Mecca, China being, you know, probably a strong second with a huge population. And so it should come as no surprise that these are the markets that are driving most of the growth today. Um, and you're going to see that again wherever there are gamers. Um, gamers are kind of driving most of this adoption. Um, I'm a professional gamer by background as well. Uh, but I stopped playing games and stopped managing markets and virtual worlds in favor of playing, you know, the ultimate game, uh, the game of life. Um, and playing with real markets instead of virtual ones. Um, so the next big sort of market that you're going to see that drives adoption is going to be on the consumer side. Um, uh, and it's not going to really be in places like here. I used to be approached by Americans all the time. They'd come up and they'd be like, you know, wanting to start a fight with me, basically. All aggressive. And they'd be like, hey, yeah, I read a story. I'm not sure they ever finished it, but they read it online. Uh, by, by some journalist that probably had no clue what they were talking about, you know not necessarily fake news, just call it poorly or uninformed news. And uh, they'd be like, Brock, why should I want Bitcoin? And I'd be like, you shouldn't. They'd like, what do you mean I shouldn't? <laughs> well, it's not for you. And I'm like, what do you mean not for me? Like, well, do you have a bank account? And they'd be like, yeah. And I'd be like, I'm guessing you got a piece of plastic in your pocket too that lets you conveniently pay for things. And you've got rule of law. You've got faith in the system. And of the 200 currencies in the world, you've got one that everyone wants more of. You know, this is going to improve your life by one or two percent unless you're a speculator. And judging by the way that you've approached this conversation, I don't think you're speculating long. And I would strongly advise you not to speculate short, whatever you feel. Um, I go, but if we go south of the border, if we go look at Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia, you've got three billion people on the planet with no financial services. Another two plus billion people on the planet with limited access to financial services. One of the things this technology is going to do is democratize the global financial system in a way where every human being on the planet is going to have equal access. And it's the least fortunate billions of people that are going to be the biggest beneficiaries. So, in the same way that Africa leapfrogged wired telecommunications and straight to wireless, this is where you're going to see the next big wave post gamers is going to be in the developing world, where the necessity is greatest. Does anyone know what the most advanced payment market in the world is? Africa. Well, Kenya to be specific. Yes, you got the continent right. Um, <laughs> Sorry, but, I see. <laughs> but you, but you got you, you, you had the right answer. Kenya. Would, would you have thought that Kenya would be the most advanced? They're the most advanced because the need was the greatest. Um, so in Kenya, eighty percent of all payments are done with mobile phones, and they're not using the government issued money. They're not using the Kenyan show. They're not using fiat. They're using prepaid cell phone minutes called M-Pesa, which is Vodafone has a subsidiary for Africa called Safaricom, which has a subsidiary called M-Pesa. And so they're using, instead of the gold standard, call it the telco standard. That's the primary form of money in Kenya. Because they needed it. They couldn't open bank accounts because they didn't have addresses. And banks have KYC sort of restrictions and things that these not you know fully developed markets just can't even comply with. You know, to be able to join 
call it the, the traditional financial world. They don't have an option. There's 70 million people, by the way, in America that belong to the on or under bank, 35 million on bank, 35 under million under bank. And a lot of those on bank people can't open an account in America. The banks won't open. Literally, they're denied access to the financial system, probably because of a mistake they made earlier in life. For many of them, their accounts went negative in 2008, 9, 10. And when they had a negative balance for any extended period of time, their accounts got shut down and they got put on a blacklist. They're unable to ever open an account again. They're basically denied access to the system. And having access to financial tools is almost as important as having access to clean drinking water. You know, we take these things for granted. So that's where you're going to see the major adoption. And why it hadn't happened yet is just like the internet wasn't very useful in 92, 93, because it was only available to call it developers, because you didn't have the basic infrastructure, you didn't have the bridges, the roads, the tunnels. You didn't have a browser. You know, Netscape was 94. You didn't have a search engine. You didn't have content. You didn't have things to buy. You need kind of that, the, that basic infrastructure. And so the last few years have been about building that infrastructure. And that infrastructure is finally becoming available for things like Bitcoin, which is like gold 2.0. It's a store of value. You're starting to see the disruption of the entire venture industry. That's what Ethereum is doing. It's really you know, the ICO market, which is disrupting venture. It's changing the, call it the uh, capital formation in the early days. And you know, soon we're going to have the first scalable blockchains. Uh, the first things that can do millions of transactions at no fees that are going to enable all the consumer apps. That's going to start next year. So next year is really kind of when, uh, call it the new internet launches. Um, this is really just an evolution of the internet itself. So if I wanted to describe the internet in three words, I would call it a data transport protocol. Simply put, it's a system for moving information. The problem is it's insecure. It's an insecure data transport protocol. And so we've only been able to do a very small percentage of what's possible because of that security limitation. It's really only been used to move information that can be copied. And as a result of that, you don't put anything of value on the internet. And so most of the really exciting things that can be done today have not been possible because the internet's broken. Um, now, you need a security layer. So the blockchain is what's going to take this internet, call it 1.0, and turn it into the new internet, which is ultimately going to replace everything. Because we're going to go from a data, an insecure data transport protocol to a secure data transport protocol. And I think that happens June 1st of next year. That's when the new internet launches. Uh, I'm one of the founders of a thing called Block One. We're making EOS. Uh, my partner, Dan Larimer, uh, coined the term uh, uh, ADAP, or a Decentralized Autonomous Corporation, which I prefer to call a Decentralized Autonomous Community. I'm one of the founders, uh, founding board member of MasterCoin. There were five of us. My partner, J.R. Willett, invented the ICO, which I prefer to call an initial community offering. We did the first ICO in June of 2013. Um, and so Dan was one of the first ICOs uh, and did the first decentralized application called BitShares. Um, he then did graphene and a thing called Steemit, which uh, uh, is the most successful decentralized app in the world. If you take Dan's last two apps, BitShares and Steemit, the number of transactions on it are twice the size of all of Bitcoin and Ethereum combined. Dan's prior technologies have over 60% global market share, which is kind of an interesting thing amongst public blockchains. Uh, EOS is generation three. It's essentially Steam it, but uh, instead of having that one use case, it's been turned into a general blockchain so you can build anything on it. So when you go to Steam it, it looks like a website to you. It's a decentralized Reddit. It looks just like a website to you, but it's not a website because it's a completely decentralized application. What it is, is it's a block explorer. And so the new websites of the future are going to be block explorers that read the blockchain to basically provide you with information that can't be censored. And so when the first scalable blockchain launches June 1st of next year, essentially every single website, every single business on the internet today is going to have to be rebuilt. It's a jump ball for everything. Mm -hmm. Everything as it exists today is going to go. All of them. Um, that doesn't mean that the incumbent players aren't going to be the winner of their own markets. Obviously, they're well positioned to do that. But that's how revolutionary what's coming is going to be. The internet is only fulfilling maybe 10% of its potential everything becomes possible in under a year. So uh, uh, that's kind of exciting. Um, <laughs> a little bit. Uh, so uh, uh, I started the first venture firm in the space called Blockchain Capital, so Barry Silbert and myself have been the main VCs in the space for the last five years. 
Um, earlier this year, I did the, the first tokenization of the security. Uh, almost everything that you see in the space today is what you call a utility token. Then there's a number of different ways that those utility tokens get structured. But I was frustrated by a lot of them because a lot of them look horrible to me. A lot of them structurally, I'm convinced, are going to you know, lose all of their participants, their communities, you know, all of the resources that are being allocated there. And I wanted to show people that these things can be done differently. It doesn't have to be a utility token. And some of them should be, and some of them are. But you can do things like a security token. A uh, security token meaning like an equity. Meaning a, a token where your users have rights, uh, maybe ownership, rights to royalties, dividends, etc. These utility tokens don't really provide for any of that. They're structured in such a way that through scarcity, you hope, you know, with adoption, uh, there'll be appreciation in the, uh, in the tokens. But uh, we did a security token. So I hacked uh, Regulation D and Regulation S for the Jobs Act and basically did an issuance out of Singapore. And I raised our third fund, which was just an experiment. It was meant to be something to show people what's possible. Uh, we raised our, our third fund, I think, in 16 minutes from 800 investors in 80 countries. And so the goal there was to show the entire market that you can do things differently. It doesn't need to be a utility token. You can do security tokens. The laws are there. You just have to be compliant with them. And uh, that opens up a bunch of really interesting things. For one, I said it's going to be the death of venture capital. But it's not only going to kill venture, it's going to kill private equity. Uh, and it's going to kill REITs. Um, because the, the problem with those asset classes are that they're illiquid for one. Uh, how many investors want liquidity if given a choice? It's going to be 100 percent Unless you're trying to defend some ridiculous position, but everyone prefers liquidity if given a choice. Second is it democratizes everything. Historically, venture has only been available to the, the called the financial elite, pensions, endowments, and high net worth family offices. Yeah, this is going to make it accessible to everyone. And I think that liquidity and democratization are wonderful things. And that's going to be very, very disruptive for those industries. So what does that evolve into? VCs are not going to just go away because a lot of what VCs do is valuable. You know, VCs, entrepreneurs, innovators are still going to need people that can provide them with, you know, seed stage resources, uh, connections, advice, etc. You know, the problem is there's not many real VCs left. I mean, most of the people that call themselves venture capitalists are not venture capitalists. You know, venture capital was a wonderful thing through the 60s, 70s, 80s, and even into the 90s. But something happened in the 90s onward, and that is that it really became financial engineering. You know, most of these people that parade themselves or call themselves VCs are not really helping entrepreneurs. They're financial engineers that have figured out how to get late-stage capital and it's just capital allocation. They're not VCs. They're fakers. They're posers. Asset managers. Yeah, they're asset managers. And so they, they, there's still going to be room for people that actually roll up their sleeves and help entrepreneurs get shit done. You know, that ain't going away. You know, it's just the structure is going to change. And I think what we'll be left with are the seed stage guys, the guys that are managing $5 million, $10 million, $50 million funds, in some cases, maybe $100 million funds. But the rest of it is going to turn into something that looks a lot more like a hedge fund. You know, everything's going to look more like hedge funds that have liquidity, maybe daily liquidity, not even quarterly redemption rights. I mean, liquidity is coming everywhere. Um, so that's uh, probably worth noting. And what's the impact going to be, you know, on the stock market, for example? You know, all of the NASDAQ, the New York Stock Exchange, et cetera, all of them are going to die. They're all going away as they're currently architected. And that doesn't mean that they won't evolve. You know, it's about evolution. It's about evolving. It doesn't mean that they're not going to evolve. But look at it from this perspective. I can take my company public through an IPO on a local exchange, a local market. In the U.S., I'll be the big market. But it's still a local market that runs from 9 to 4 on weekdays. It runs on old, slow, expensive insecure technology built for a world of paper. Or I can do an ICO, which provides, you know, which is a global listing that runs on infrastructure that runs 24 by 7 by 365 that's this most secure, efficient technology we've ever seen. I mean, how do you think that story ends? Yeah, it should be pretty obvious that when new, when evolution is happening, when new systems are coming along, sometimes they're so much better than what exists that they render the existing market and everything that's there obsolete. This is, is where you see you know, game-changing sort of innovation. And the NASDAQ is obviously the furthest along. They co-invest with me and tons of stuff they're doing. They're moving hard. The Chicago Mercantile Exchange has been deep in this business since 2014, as has NASDAQ. So the incumbents don't always go away, but they have to evolve. It's innovate or die. So I'm not saying all those businesses are going to be dead. I'm just saying their current structure will be. And that's the challenge that we as the entrepreneurs have. 
you know, where the battle is between the incumbent and the innovator, and the incumbent has a lot of the advantages. You know, they have the resources, the scale, and everything else. I mean, the problem is they normally are just there trying to protect their existing business model, you know, versus you know evolving. But as we all know, that's not an option anymore. Um, but to take it back even a little further. Um, Prior to the Industrial Revolution, over 90% of the world's population were entrepreneurs. There were only two big centralized institutions at the time, church and state. There were no companies. There were no big companies. They did not exist. This is a new thing. This is something that has only happened as a result of the Industrial Revolution, and that's because we needed to be, have ways to finance you know, the building of these businesses. And so we created what we think of today as the corporation in its current form which evolved into mega corporations that were delivering efficiency of scale through Six Sigma and all this sort of stuff. But what it did is it enslaved humanity. I mean, it provided us with a lot of beautiful things that we have around us, a lot of innovation that's come from it. But the corporation itself needs to die. The corporation itself is an old, antiquated thing that is no longer serving its intended purpose. You know, systems are built with an intentional and original design to accomplish something, and the corporation did that. But then what happens is these systems become old, and from a Darwinian sort of evolutionary perspective, they no longer are serving their intended goal, they just try to survive. And they try to protect themselves, and they try to stay in whatever position they're in, even though they're no longer, they're, they're no longer serving their intended purpose. But I'll tell you why. The corporation has three primary constituents. You've got the customer who you know, wants a good product or service, um, you know, hopefully at a good price. I mean, money for nothing and chicks for free, they'd take it for free if they could. Um, the employee, on the, the other hand, you know, wants to show up and do something they feel good about, and they want to be remunerated in such a way they can go about living their life. They'd probably take all the money that they could, too. Uh, the shareholder always just wants, you know, generally speaking, a, a maximum return on investment. The problem with that is between these three constituents, you have a complete and total misalignment of interest. Their interests are not aligned. And as anyone knows that has done any business, that it's about having alignment of interest. If my interests are perfectly aligned with yours, I don't need a contract. A contract exists to help manage through conflicts of interest. And so how do we expect a system that is misarchitected at the foundation to serve people well in the long run? It can't. So there's a couple of macro trends that are happening here. One is that we're moving from proprietary ownership you know, of software, from software to open source software, from proprietary ownership of things, you know, from hardware to shared hardware, and then this concept of centralization and decentralization is the combination of those three things. So when you combine these things, which is what we're seeing today, something amazing can happen. So if I want to participate in one of these decentralized autonomous communities, I'm normally going to need a token. Imagine you can only buy Apple products with Apple stock. What happens is to be a customer, a member of a tribe or a community, to be a customer of that system, I need to have tokens, which means if that community does well, I'm probably benefiting from the appreciation of that system's growth and success. If it's not, I'm doing poorly with that community, but my interests become aligned with that community as a token holder. So I start to look like both a customer and a shareholder. But now that I'm benefiting from anything that's happening that that community does, I probably also want to start contributing, meaning I probably start telling my friends about it. Or I might be a developer and start building on it. If I'm a designer, I might be adding to it. What happens is you start to look a little bit like an employee, though you're not really any of these things because we're not going to have jobs in the future. We're all going to be unemployed, but that's not a bad thing. You know, what happens is you start to become members of tribes and communities and the things that you feel passionate about. But what happens is in those systems that are all open source, I start to look like a customer, employee, and a shareholder all at once. I wear all of those hats. And what happens is you get a complete and total alignment of interest. And the world is going to be moving in that direction. We're going to be moving away from corporations to decentralized autonomous communities that are all open source. And another amazing thing about open source, you know, we built a world and the corporation is designed to create a zero-sum game. You know, it's basically saying everything should be a competition. It's me against you. For me to win, you have to lose. Is this mentality that exists in the world and it's completely flawed. And we can do better if you stop looking at the symptoms and start addressing the underlying causes. And you start to fix the problem at the root. And it is things like the corporation that is the problem. You know, we don't look at it there because most people don't think deep enough. They don't go far enough to the basis of the problem. And so in that open source world with these types of communities, historically, if I saw something of value like money on a table, 
I try not to keep it for myself. I try to keep that information for me. But in a system where anything you do in that community benefits me, anything any of you do benefits me, anything I do benefits you, we start to move away from a world of me to a world of we. And we go from a world of scarcity to a world of abundance. Yeah, so, I mean, these are the types of things that most people don't understand when they first come into the spaces. They don't understand how disruptive or innovative this really is and how it's really going to help us evolve. But it's a beautiful thing. And as you start to understand more and more about the space, it becomes impossible to work on anything else. If you start realizing <laughs> Well, you start realizing that everything that you're doing is almost a waste of time. Your dream for your life 10 years from now and everything you've designed and you went to your school and this and that, you're like, ah, oh, I'm winning. It's all happening. You know, you start realizing that everything that you're working on is going to be obsolete and goes, and goes away soon. <coughs> And when you start to understand that, it becomes very hard to waste your time, knowing that it's mostly for naught. And you start to join this revolution, um, which is going to change the world, and I would argue so. <coughs> you know, we are in a very dangerous place as a species. Most of you may sense this. Mm -hmm. you know, we are getting dangerously close to evolving off of the planet, becoming machines. And that's because most of us operate too much with our minds and not enough with our hearts. Uh, the logo of EOS is interesting and quite amazing. If you have never looked at it, it's, uh, it's a chest dehedron, which is the sacred geometrical shape of the heart. And mankind needs to learn to lead with their hearts and then follow with their minds and bring balance back. You know, it's being aware and understanding. And so, like, what I tell people that want to pitch me things uh, lately is, um, I'm a gamer. I am the game master of my game, mm. of my world. And games have rules. Um, as you try to progress through them, and I tell people, you know, if you want to come pitch me something, don't come up to me and just sell me your deal. Don't tell me just what your ICO is. And think that by telling me how you're going to make me money, that's going to get me interested. I'm constantly talking about how a billionaire is not someone with a billion dollars. A unicorn isn't a billion dollar company. A billionaire or a unicorn to me is an individual or a community that has positively changed or impacted the lives of a billion people. The old adage of money being power is coming to an end. That paradigm is over. You know, in this new paradigm, it's technology is power, it's consciousness is power, it's heart. You know, those are what the real billionaires of the future are going to be. And um, so if you think that coming up to me and telling me how you're going to make me some money is what's going to get me excited, uh, you're you know, very mistaken. Uh, we're reinventing it. Um, and so what I tell people is it's about establishing an actual relationship, a human connection. You know, you walk up to me and you say, hey, I've been to Burning Man. You know, you skipped to level 10. You walk up to me and say, here's my deal. Here's how we can make some money. You know, it's like Flappy Bird, but you died in the first, like, thing. <laughs> uh, you know, it's called, I don't, that's not what's going to get me interested, because your project is probably stupid. <laughs> like most startups, 90% of them fail in the first three years. And that doesn't mean, you know, that you're bad. It's called, this is your project. You know, but I'm not investing in your project. I'm investing in you. And that means I'm probably funding this deal, the next deal, the third deal. You know, because I've decided that you're someone that I want to support. But you don't get there by hawking your deal like you're a, a, a salesman of a watch on the street. You know, if you get there by walking up and establishing a human connection, have a conversation with me. You know, do it thoughtfully. Um, you know, and at some point, once you've established a relationship, you know, what I say, if you don't know what to say, is we're all superheroes. And we all have superpowers. If you don't know what your superpowers are, I would strongly encourage you to spend some time to reflect on that. What I mean by superpowers are, what are your skills? What are you good at? You know, it's not what, it, what, it, what, it, what is the company you're building, it's what are you good at? And so, if you don't know what to say, walk up and tell me what your superpower is. Meaning, what is that skill in life that you've refined and you've gotten good at that uniquely makes you special? Um... And once I understand that, tell me how you're using that skill, that superpower, to make the world a better place. Tell me what that grand vision is. 
What is your reason for being? And then we can talk, if we're still talking about what your current project is, you know, how you're applying that skill to make the world a better place through this current project. You know, this, this is a more appropriate way to get to know people. And this is not just when you talk to me, this is how you should talk to everybody. You know, we too often walk up to people and say, hey, you know, what do you do? What that really means is, what can you do for me? Because I'm trying to efficiently, as quickly as possible, figure out what I can take from you. It's one of the, it's a disgusting habit. Versus walking up to people and saying, what can I do for you? You know, in life there's this Japanese concept known as ikigai, which is figuring out what you love, what you're passionate about, figuring out what you're good at, and figuring out what the world needs. And at the intersection of those three things is ikigai, and that is when you find your life's purpose. And once you find that, and you start doing what you love, what you're good at, and what the world needs, I promise you, you'll make more money than you ever will if money was your focus. <coughs> you know, once you do, and you, know, and you don't even need money at that point. <laughs> you don't even need money at that point because the life just becomes wonderful. Because it just feels really good to be doing good shit to help others. And so what you should be doing is figuring out what you're good at and figuring out how to give that to people, figuring out how to pay it forward. If you start going around and sharing your gifts, your superpowers with others, and you do that in a way where it's not about what others can do for you, but what you can do for them, you know, it starts to change everything, and you'll end up with more. It's kind of how it works. I mean, these are simple things that most people have just, for whatever reason, not figured out, maybe because they didn't have the right teachers. You know, you know we're here to have gifts, and we're here to share our gifts. We're here to teach people. Uh, and... Yeah, great things can, can happen there. Um, what else is worth talking about? Uh, you know, you're in an ICO panel. I'll talk briefly about ICO. It was we're coming out of the end of call it the ICO uh, 1.0 wave, um, and that is you know coming and slowing down because of a lack of governance. You know, too much FOMO, market hype, and uh, you know investors or participants in these deals are realizing that. They're not working out, and a lot of them are, some are great, but you know, the deal, the market's gotten a little out of hand, and the market needs to upgrade. There's another Japanese word, uh, a term known as Kaizen, which is to be continually improving. I think that too many people build things because they can be built, not because they should be built. They see a little hack in the market, an opportunity to make some money with some sort of exploit or something. And they go do that because their focus is making money and it's not about doing things well. They want to hack a project together in a weekend, like it's a hackathon. Versus actually taking the time to figure out what you're good at and reflect on the best way to apply that skill in your life. You know, people don't build things to last. And this is another byproduct of, um, you know, the Industrial Revolution, but more World War II probably than anything else. You know, the West won, America won, because in this concept of good, fast, and cheap, pick two, we won the war by going fast and cheap. You know, it wasn't necessarily about being good. We just overpowered you with volume, mediocrity. But in war, that was a very effective strategy. But post-World War II, we kind of kept it, you know, here in this country. We stopped making good things. We just made good and, you know, cheap things, you know, good, you know, maybe fast and cheap things. And, you know, in life, you know, when you reflect on it later, when you look back on your life, don't you want to like point to things that you built that were like <laughs> awesome? Unfortunately, to build awesome things normally can't be done quickly. It normally has to be done thoughtfully, and it requires a lot of time. Uh, you know, how do you build things to last? You know, and, and the Japanese have this term called kaizen, which is to be continually improving, but it's to become a master of your craft. You know, we live in a world of mediocrity today, where people are building mediocre things versus building great things. You know, things that might take you your entire life. And you think about things like the Great Pyramids that are still there today. You know, we can build things like that today. It's kind of sad that almost nothing like that is being built in the world today. No one is building things to last that, you know, will, projects that will see, you know, potentially generations go by during that project's development to be a part of big things that will change the world and last. Um, so these are just some interesting ideas. But so the ICO market isn't been kaizening enough. 
it hasn't been upgrading, people are just like, oh, that's what the last person did, and they're rushing it out and trying to do the same thing, versus you should approach every situation in life and say, how can I make it best? How can I do it better than the last person? How can I upgrade the system? Because it's all kind of like a video game, and you want to just keep going up in levels. You don't want to stay on that same level the rest of your life, living in a loop. You know, figure out how to move up. And sometimes you'll find those moments in life where something happens where huge reflection, it's like your life has just transformed in a short period of time. And that's kind of like in Mario when you get that flute, you get to skip forward a bunch of levels. Um, but, uh, you know, the ICO market is going to go through that. Right now, you're, we're kind of in a forking market. Um, yeah. It's all, it's, lately, it's all about forks. Um, and forks are good. You are all forks. Forks that came out of spooning. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, consensual forks. Hopefully. <laughs> but you have contentious forks as well. Uh, and contentious forks are not just in all forking is all evolution comes from forks. And yeah, sometimes they're gonna be contentious, and that sometimes is gonna lead to extinction. And watching how the sausage is made, certainly when it's a not when it's a contentious fork, is never a pretty thing. But um, that one thing, if you're new, I wouldn't sell any of your fork tokens. It's not free money. You do not know what's going to win. We don't know which Bitcoin is going to win. You know, of the major ones, Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. The idea of what Bitcoin Gold is, um, uh, uh, but these things are communities, and uh, great communities have leaders. But there's something more important than the leader in every one of these projects. And that is the first follower. And then the second follower. Because people don't follow leaders, they actually follow followers. There's one follower that follows the leader. Whoever that first person is. It's that person that sees someone who's kind of crazy. Have you ever seen that video of the dancing guy? Yeah. 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 It's that guy that looks nuts. But someone saw something beautiful in that crazy person's behavior. And they decided to follow. That's who everyone else is following. And then they're following the second followers. Um, and so uh, uh, you, know, you need real leadership and you need you know, real followers. And the followers are the ones that really drive everything. And it's all about building community. This is about community you know, going forward. So you have to look at you know, the people that are running these projects. And are these, you know, call it the people that can build real communities. Communities that are going to inspire people you know, to get involved. Um, but uh, you know, we don't know who the winner of these things are going to be, so when in doubt, if you don't know what you're doing, wait. Okay. Maybe don't do anything. <laughs> um, and so that's one thing uh, I think to be you know, mindful of. Um, but the ICO 2.0 market is coming. It'll be sometime next year. You now have hundreds of institutions being formed, you know, funds like hedge funds, <laughs> big funds. Lots of hundred million, a billion dollar funds. They're all forming right now. They'll, You'll see a bunch of them formed in the first half of next year. But when you start to have all of this institutional capital in these vehicles, it's going to be financing this next wave. It's going to make what you've seen so far this year look tiny. You know, we've taken in over $3 billion this year in ICOs. You know, next year is probably $30 billion. Um, but it's mostly not going to be in utility tokens and things where there's no rights. You have, these are institutions. These are fiduciaries of other people's resources. They are going to expect some rights. So the market's going to be, I think, mostly securities, you know, coming into next year. Certainly by 2019, a majority of the market are going to be securities. And so if you're looking at your project or you're looking at participating in someone's project, as the entrepreneurs, ask yourself in the design, um, what is best for your community? What is best for your users? Are your users going to benefit more from a utility token structure or are they going to benefit more from a securities structure. And it's very easy to figure out what you do. Always do what's best for your community. The success of your project depends on that because it's only about building a community. So always do what's best for the community. And if you always do what's best for the community, always do what's best for you know the people that are joining your project, the employees, the customers, if you always design for them first, not for you, you're building a world of we, you know, that's where success comes. And so in evaluating these things, whichever role you're in, try to decide, is this going to be a successful community? And look at the traits of the people that are building it. Are these community leaders? Are these people that are going to get you know, a million people to follow them? 
Um, and that's where the ICO 2.0 market is coming. It's going to disrupt everything. Um, what else? Uh, I've probably talked for about as much time as we have. Maybe we want to do a couple of questions.